Okay, good morning to everyone, uh, to all our participants. Good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from for this highly anticipated in conversation with on decolonizing African identities. It's no secret that this topic is laden with a number of new and old questions and conversations that continue to define how Africans on the continent and across the diaspora are navigating space, time and interactions. Um, it's an honor and absolute uh, privilege to welcome Dr. Althea Maria Rivas and Professor Dr. Sabelo Ndlovo Gacheni to virtual stage. Thank you. Uh, just to briefly uh, kind of go through their extensive accomplishments, Dr. Rivas is a feminist and decolonial theorist and lecturer at the School of Oriental and African Studies. She employs innovative grounded methodologies such as photo voice, storying and narratives to explore debates in the fields of conflict, security and development. Her research focuses on exploring the politics of development, conflict, humanitarian intervention and peace. She previously worked for 12 years in the areas of diplomacy, post-conflict reconstruction, humanitarian assistance and gender. Professor Ndlovu Gacheni is a historian and decolonial or post-colonial theorist. He's a professor and chair of epistemologies of the Global South with an emphasis on Africa at the University of Beirut in Germany and a member of the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence at the same institution. His field of work comprises the decolonial or post-colonial theory, empire and colonialism, politics of knowledge and decolonization of higher education, Black Radical Tradition or Black Marxism and African History. Before handing over to our speakers to make their opening remarks, I'd like to remind participants to re-engage with one another using the chat function on the right-hand side of their screen, as well as to ask, speaker, uh, to ask questions to speakers using the Q&A function on the right, on the, yeah, on the right side, my bad, um, of their screen. Questions will be addressed in the latter half of the session. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, without further ado, it's, it's my honor and privilege to, to hand over to our speakers. I think Dr. Althea is experiencing a little bit of a technical difficulty. So Prof. Sabelo, if you're happy to go first with uh, your opening on remarks. Okay, no, thank you so much uh, for, the, for the invitation to this important discussion. And I think uh, the, the, the starting point really is uh, that you know, the who am I as an African? And I think that question actually can start us very well in the sense that I will say, if I was asked that question, I will say, I'm actually a product and a child of, uh, of complex histories. And I will also say that I'm also a product and a child of uh, complex struggles against uh, racism, against slavery, against colonialism. And uh, if I depart from that uh, uh, type of uh, entry point, and I, I think uh, the, the next uh, important question is, uh, because we're talking about decolonizing ITs, perhaps we need to start from the start whereby we say, but how are identities colonized in the first instance? And uh, that I think will open the canvas more wider because if we then say the human identities, yes, be, can be colonized, not only those of Africans, but any human identities can be colonized and that the process uh, really can be traced back to the unfolding of Euro modernity. And uh, in, during that time, the colonization of identities took two forms. The first was social classification of human population, and the second was their racial hierarchization, so that you create then a pyramidal social structure uh, within which some humans are pushed down that structure, they pushed almost out of the human family uh, into, into, into non-beings. And the Africans actually, uh, they have suffered that uh, uh, that process of being pushed, uh, if not down into sub human category, they've been pushed almost out of the human family. And, they, and they, that actually then re, redefined them either as natives, as primitives, as, as, and they, all, these other, all these other names, which, which they never named themselves with, but which are actually names cascading from a power structure. So I will, I will, I will think that 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 will be 
an important starting point to think about this question of uh, of uh, of uh, of African identity. Yeah, I would. Can I go ahead? Yeah, I would agree. I think it's important to kind of think about the the socially constructed and historical nature of uh, ideas of of Africanness and blackness, and really to to center and as a beginning point, the fact that you know Europeans kind of um, through the biological and cultural calculus of, of racialization with indigenous people and you know what they term black people, um, you know they they felt they needed to do that as part of the moral argument for exploitation. Mm -hmm. And through that, the dehumanization of people was necessary to then justify colonialism. That was part of the, the story that they needed, you know, that was also based in their biblical text, but that was the moral argument for really what was exploitation, dehumanization, um, of large groups of people. And in that story, they felt that, you know, these terms were necessary, not just um, so that we could talk about people in categories, but also because um, in their minds, uh, African people didn't have any kind of understanding of themselves, right? So it was a way to then help the natives, right? Um, understand or situate themselves or give them an, a, a proper image of themselves, which was essentially that of um, a dehumanized character. Right, and as black people, or as savages, or as evil, right, as primitive, as as um, the professor said. I think uh, uh, this 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 becomes a, really takes us to the second level of uh, of engagement on this question of uh, of uh, of uh, African identities, in the sense that uh, uh, the question of Africanness and then the question of blackness. It uh, becomes actually very important. We need to really maybe unpack how did we end up with these identities and the, how are they related? The question of blackness, question of Africanness, and again, uh, from our starting point, that uh, there are two processes here. There is a, a, a historical process of domination, exploitation, dehumanization on the one hand. Then there is another process of resisting uh, these processes. And within that, what are the type of identities which emerge? Of course, the, we, the, 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 the modernist, the Eurocentric uh, historical processes, they push the African uh, <clears throat> people uh, into, in, they define them in, in their own terms. Uh, and they, and they, I, I remember W.E.P. Du Bois saying, prior to modernity, being black, was a, 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 a subject of curiosity. And he uses the terms like Othello, uh, Prester John, as, 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 and he said it was never really a subject of, uh, of, of inferiorization. Uh, okay. Only with the time of enslavement, that's when it changes from being a description of a people to actually being a marker of inferiority, inferiorization. And it emerges concurrently with the concept of whiteness, of course. Whiteness being being the identity which carries the badge of honor of superiority, and the blackness carrying the badge of of uh, of uh, inferiority. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it is also during that time, uh, if you link the histories very well, that also the issue of uh, cartography and the mapping of the world to continents begins then to also create all these 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 issues of uh, 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 names like Africans, Europeans. Uh, uh, Asians and the, all this, uh, but what is interesting then in terms of the relationship between Africanness and the blackness? Africanness, of course, starts as a negative uh, 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 a designation of a people, uh, inferiorization. But uh, the interesting part is how those who were de designated as such, how they then appropriated that name and then use it as a unitary, uh, a uniting. Uh, uh, term which then provokes uh, African consciousness and uh, at the same time using it to mobilize and uh, then uh, uh, refocus again on the Eurocentric definition. So uh, I remember Achima Feche, the South African uh, intellectual saying, had it not been for Eurocentrism, we will not have Eurocentrism. <laughs> it, it, it fundamentally means that the uh, it's a reaction to some historical processes. Hence, our starting point about understanding the histories involved in this in this definition. Yeah, and I think picking up on that, it's it's 
it was important, I think, to start the conversation in terms of rooting it in kind of these historical processes and also understanding the colonization. I mean, colonialism is, is uh, it, it was, you know, an event, but it, the ongoing reparations of that then also lead to a reclaiming of blackness and pan-Africanness, but all, that, and that continues to be dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the tensions sometimes that occurs is um, particularly in like black studies or diasporic studies, which tend to be rooted in particular um, kind of temporalities, is mm -hmm. that the diaspora is connected only to Africa. It's through um, kind of the rubrics of, of travel and migration, the middle passage, right? Mm -hmm. And it, in some ways this then reifies these binary frameworks. Um, that focus on things like uh, home and host or displacement and homeland mm -hmm. without letting us you know, um, engage in the dynamic processes in which these things then continue to um, change and, and um, the, the way in which solidarity, politics, um, mm -hmm. economics then also begin to take different reformations to explain the, not the identity politics, which is how some people like to kind of um, narrow this down to, but the, the politics of experience really, and how diverse that is both between and within groups. Yeah, in fact, um, yeah, that's, a, that's an important uh, aspect um, of, of, of a way of thinking about it, because there is one way, on the one hand, the historical processes actually impose the necessity to essentialize identity. And the, the essentialization may be to think from uh, Gayatri Spivak, the strategic essentialization for purposes of solidarities and for purposes of resistance. And, but at the same time, being careful not also to be carried away by the essentialization to the extent that then we ignore the pluralities. But I, I, I am always persuaded by the, the fundamental and the perennial question posed by the Harlem poet, uh, Count Cullen, which says, what is Africa to me? I think that that question becomes very useful in this type of debate because it depends where you are located uh, in, in terms of defining what is Africa to you. Uh, for those who are in the, in the pushed by the kidnapping and the, the transportation and the, the commodification into, 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 into slaves. Africa becomes a home where they were taken from. And, they, and, they, and they nobody then query them for thinking that way because it's a circumstance where they find themselves. So you will find Dubois actually explaining, saying, my ancestors, that is where my ancestors came from. And uh, that's my relation with the, with the, with the continent. And uh, those in the continent, they also think about Africa as their place, as their home, but again, a home whereby they were actually then, uh, instead of having experienced slavery, they also experienced colonialism. Mm -hmm. And the colonialism, even if it leaves you within the continent, but it alienates you from your history, from your language, from your culture, uh, from, from, from almost, the, it redefines you as, as a native, and then the subject of, of, of power, whereby you, have, you lose the power to self-define. De self so I, I, I like that question of saying, what is Africa to me? Because you can use that to explore so many standpoints in relation to what is Africa, uh, to the extent that you therefore then uh, have various permutations of Africa as a place, Africa as an idea, Africa as a home, Africa as a reality. Africa is something which we are fighting to, to, to actually construct in our own terms. Uh, if we then link it with the Pan-Africanist project, we, 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 we actually make it an ideal and an ideal which actually is linked to the whole liberatory discourse of saying, but if we defined by other people, if we were actually scattered across the world by other processes in which we were actually victims rather than the agents in that processes, we will need maybe to come together using African, using black consciousness. We come together, unite, so that we redefine ourselves. And I like the second concept, which actually comes from Gukwa Thiongo, which is the concept of remembering. In other words, the scattering and the dismemberments. It means, therefore, when we think about Africa as an ideal, we're thinking about us now taking charge of redefining ourselves, of actually gaining what we call and maybe sovereign selfhood. Yeah, because I think just picking up on that, you know, Africa is, is often diasporic studies, um, 
kind of positioned as this timeless cultural kind of political baseline as opposed to a convivial space of production of black identities in the present. Right. So, you know, we can't really, often the idea is that we can't speak of identity and community formation without recognizing and interrogating the mutually constitutive positions, right, of Africa and the African diasporic populations. And really repositioning of Africa um, in a way that places the continent within global discourses of racialization and mm -hmm. identity formation, right, as opposed to this like authentic, you know, static place mm -hmm. is really important. And in doing so, I think that allows us to then kind of bring post-colonial Africa into dialogue with mm -hmm. other conversations or analysis of race, process of racialization, transnational production of black identities, empowerment and resistance in a way that is living and dynamic. Yeah, in fact, um, uh, the way Africa maybe sits in the global dynamics, maybe we can think about it in two ways. The Viwa Imudimbe way, the idea of Africa, which actually then underscores how external forces defined what is Africa and what is Africanness. But you can just oppose that with the African idea of Africa, mm -hmm. whereby Africans themselves have been across history and the space trying to define themselves. And that actually then takes us perhaps to the moments of Pan-Africanism, to the moments of nationalism, mm -hmm. whereby you then find people like uh, Kwame Nkrumah saying, I was not born in Africa, Africa was born in me. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm actually constructing and making Africa. And the Africa then emerges that which can be invented and reinvented either from outside or from inside. So with the nationalist uh, phase of, of, the, of the African struggles, you will then find that there is more people like you know, people like Nkwame Nkrumah and there's so many others working very hard to redefine Africa from inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and they actually define it. This is where it is interesting that the question of plurality and the question of uh, what they call essentialism, from a nationalist point of view, it was necessary to essentialize. It was necessary to essentialize our, our identities for a purpose, for a political purpose, for an economic purpose, for a cultural purpose. So for a people who have been dismembered, and that issue of remembering fundamentally entails that you connect the dots, and that connecting of the dots in order then to re, re, reunite what has been disunited and they, then it raises this question of saying, are you not therefore essentializing the whole issue? Africa is diverse. And they, I, I, I actually picked uh, what uh, Nkwame Nkrumah said sometime when he said, we in Africa with the islands are one Africa. We reject the idea of any kind of partition from Tangia to or Cairo in the north to Cape Town in the south, from Cape Gutfin in the east to Cape Verde Islands. Africa is one indivisible. And he's making a statement that this is the Africa we want to, 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 to create. And that's the Africa which I'm thinking it actually still exists as an aspiration. And this makes sense within a context. This is why I will always emphasize history, not because I'm trained as a historian. I will emphasize history because at Berlin in 1884, 1885, they fragmented what they found and they created colonies. And, they, and they, that fragmentation is also not, uh, Africans did not participate in actually redefining themselves as colonial subjects uh, with borders and everything. And they, when nationalism then come, the problem is then to, to then adhere to those borders to the extent that the fragmentation continues. We then re-emerge out of colonialism as Nigerians, as Zimbabwean, as Sudanese, as this and that, but still that other broader transitional uh, impulse of uniting actually stands, still hovers above that, with Nkrumah still pushing the idea that, yes, we have uh, national sovereignties, but I don't think they mean anything without Pan-African unity. And that Pan-African unity needs not only to be continental, but it needs also to reach into, into the diaspora. Yeah, and I think it's important to recognize those two processes, right? So the, the process of kind of like 
group solidarity or nationalism or whatever, depending on you know where you're placed, how you see that, but also then the, the larger kind of overarching frame of, of common experience. But I think one of the things that um, you know a lot of the scholarship today. Oh, you know, things that we still need to unpick is the, the dynamics between groups as well. And that's why I think, you know, um, scholarship can can move forward in terms of understanding those intergroups. So, so the, the power hegemonies, for example, between mm. groups. Right? Yeah. Because that's also, um, I think, necessary to understand our relations through like historical dynamics. But um, also it it centers the political, emotional, cultural mm. complexity mm. of groups as well. Yeah. And is it works in, in direct resistance to the colonization and the idea of blackness as it was conceptualized by Europeans, right? Which was there, as we said at the beginning, to kind of give people um, an understanding of themselves because they didn't have that understanding. So this, mm. in, in turn, this works to say, you know, um, it unpicks the complexity of those relationships and the ways that they form over time. In fact, yeah, in fact, in fact the, the question of complexity maybe also takes us to the other force, which also then create other identities, which we normally don't speak about, uh, which actually lack within the African, the idea of African. That's the identity created by capitalist market relations, identities such as peasant, worker, bourgeois, which, which actually then complexify the issues of of, of, of in the question of class into that. But I wanted also to say, uh, my, my, my take would be, would, be a, 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 would be double one. The first one is the epistemic take, which actually emphasizes the issues of complexity, the issues of uh, dynamism and the issue, and then the political uh, take, which actually political says, but in divided, we fall. <laughs> and that one is a political is a political take that without solidarities we won't achieve anything. That is, the more we atomize, the more we will collapse. The more we we enlarge the scale, the more we will stand. So, so I think there is it is important to then think of uh, the epistemic uh, of the epistemic will will the stakes are low in the epistemics. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is really an intellectual curiosity. Of, of understanding things in their complexity. But the political one, there are higher stakes in it. And the higher stakes are actually even existential rather than only only intellectual. Mm. Yeah, I think maybe that's a good um, segue into talking about kind of decolonization or the decolonial um, movement. I think that's one of the things that we were asked to speak about. Um, mm. And I think, you know, if we, look at um, Walter Manolo's idea of epistemic disobedience, right, which means kind of calling into question the basis and control of European systems of thought. That's a, a really important concept to center in these decolonial yeah. debates. Because to me, decolonization is, you know, it, it's about very broadly speaking kind of two projects, right? So just dismantling power hierarchies on a number of different levels and then centering different stories, other stories um, and ways of knowing and being um, and the methods that we use to understand the world. And at the core of this kind of decolonization project is, is really questions about knowledge production, legitimacy, everyday practice, you know, who, whose knowledge counts, who's seeing is holding the knowledge, how do we understand our world, how do we connect the different stories in the world, and whose story is at the center of that. Yeah. And who are the legitimate tellers of the story and how do we engage with each other. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we think about movements, for example, to decolonize the university and Kilam and research, they've become quite popular kind of in the public discourse recently, but these are, are much older movements, right? There is like a history um, that needs to be recognized there of like constant resistance towards a particular project of, of um, colonization. Yeah, in fact, um, it is great that we are now moving to the, to, the, to, the, to the question of decolonization, because I think again, it's important that we are saying it is not new and uh, I, I will agree totally with that. Uh, and uh, and uh, it is not new in the sense that it is a long 10, if it is a 10. It's a 10 also with the 10s within, uh, to the extent that when we think about decolonization in relation to identities, we need maybe to expand the canvas uh, to the extent that we go back to such movements as Ethiopianism, to such movements as Gaveism, to such movements as negritude, to such movements as African personality, 
And in all of them, we, we need to adopt maybe what I will call an empathetic reading. Not a sympathetic, an empathetic reading. And an empathetic reading meaning you read these, these movements, these intellectual productions, these political productions in context, in the context, what is it that they were fighting against? And the perhaps you need maybe to frame them using what uh, Amy Azizé termed the three tormenting questions. Who am I? What are we? Who am I in the anti-black world? You, you learn that if people are fighting to answer those questions, then they develop all these various uh, 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 intellectual, cultural, political uh, uh, formations uh, as they try to define themselves. And there is this, at the center of this, it's, it's a thread which actually comes from 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 Edward, say, uh, Edward uh, Blyden, perhaps to the present roads must fall. You, you, you will see connections in, mm -hmm. in across. And these connections is about the, 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 the vicissitudes of self-writing, Af black self-writing, African self-writing, African self-definition. And they, across time, they develop this type of, 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 of cultural, uh, political, intellectual uh, movements uh, where they try to say, at this moment, the problem was like this. The, at this moment, the problem became like this. Because we see a movement of ideas, not ideas which are static, particularly about defining Africa itself. So I, I, I like to think it that way, to, to always say, when we say it is not new, uh, the, other, the other part of my, my intervention would be that this idea of newness and oldness needs to be problematized. Mm. Because something which was never achieved remains new across space and time. As far as I'm concerned, so it remains new until you resolve it. That's when you can say it is old. But as long as it is unresolved, it it will remain new. It's like a person asking for water in the morning, you don't give him or her. In the afternoon, he asks for the same water, you don't give. Then at four, he asks for the same. Then you say that you are still demanding an old thing. It is still new. I'm still thirsty. So mm. this this is the this is this this to me. Is the matter which is at the center of can self definition, self writing, and the self 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 reconstitution. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's definitely. I think it's important to recognize that it is a dynamic process, right? And this is the thing about it being a connection of experiences, not just identity. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the other things that I wanted to highlight is how it's kind of the, the missing um, aspects of, of decolonization as as it's come to be talked about in the university, right? And it yeah. goes back to what the professor was saying that often um, we're taught that it's, or we're, you know, the way it's, it's conceptualized is that we have these other stories and then those stories are brought into kind of the common curriculum. So the Haitian mm -hmm. revolution, for example, is something that's particularly in the UK, you know, people talk about, you talks about that all the time, but mm -hmm. it then is kind of, it's, it's juxtaposed to European enlightenment ideas mm -hmm. right? and then the conversation really doesn't move beyond that right mm -hmm. so it, it doesn't take that story in the context of which it happened and tell us how you know the Haitian revolution was important for the independent communities in the coast of Venezuela what it meant for the Maroons mm -hmm. in Jamaica and Nicaragua mm -hmm. right so how and how these you know leaders and communities um, communicated with each other how their ideas developed with each other you know mm -hmm. what that means today for how we can think of things like sovereignty, right? A yeah. community association, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is really for me the, the decolonial like project. Mm -hmm. Like this is mm -hmm. the, you know, to like remove, decenter Europe and think about how all of these other stories, what, mm -hmm. how they have been developing over time and what they have to tell us about how we live today, right? Mm -hmm. Not just as an interesting story about those people, you know, like mm -hmm. regional studies or in cultural studies. It's really yeah. about how, what we can understand about these ways of knowing, of being that mm -hmm. have happened, you know, like historically, but then continue as the mm -hmm. professor was saying, over time develop, what that means now, how that can, what those things can teach us. Yeah. And that, that other aspect of decolonization uh, or decolonizing, you know, the curriculum or knowledge in inst Western institutions really, um, gets lost i think a lot of the time and i think a lot of that is a reflection of the power relations um that exist within academic institutions within our society where those knowledges are not actually seen as being important enough to be centered they're seen as being important enough to be talked about so let's talk mm -hmm. about african or black writers let's have mm -hmm. these stories as a week in our curriculum but um 
you know, we know that they're not serious enough to really be centered in terms of teaching us something about how we can change the way that we live or how we can develop politically or economically, right? Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the, um, the project, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is still ongoing and will, will take some time. Yeah, indeed, indeed, uh, the, 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 the question of decolonization, again, I think the danger at the moment, at the current conjecture, is to reduce it to an epistemic question. Yeah. And I think it is not simply an epistemic question. Uh, of course, uh, it becomes a, an epistemic question when we link it with what is Africa to me that I posed earlier on. Because to some, it is just an object of study. Yeah. You need to study Africans. We need to put them in our curriculum. Uh, we need to study their histories. That's, that's an epistemic uh, uh, it depends whether you are standing there and they're saying, that is my research site, uh, is where I test my theories. But uh, what about for the people who are located there, who, who think about Africa not only as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an intellectual project, but also an existential project, who think about Africa in terms of, we really need to expand this decolonial project. The epistemic is connected to the existential uh, the existential is connected to the economic and the, and the other dynamics. So they, they, that's why I liked the roads must fall, fees must fall, the, 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 the canvas they opened in the sense that they, they went back to the question of what exactly are these universities which are located in Africa? Are they African universities or they are universities in Africa uh, which are located in an African space but they pursue an agenda which is not of Africa. Mm -hmm. So even if you rename them, give them indigenous names, but the, the epistemological scaffold in which they, are, they, they stand, it, it looks like it is located in a place, but is not of that place. And how do you make them of that place? I think that's, that's, that's a fundamental question. Then they go on to the second question that in this issue of, of trying to decolonize African identities, what about the question of language? The question of language which is used uh, within universities, which is used for teaching, research, for, for, for learning, unless we, we really master courage and they confront that, that uh, why is it that uh, 60 or 70 years after, after the so-called decolonization in the universities, in Africa, which I will not say are African universities yet, unless they resolve that, that question. Then the, they come back then to the question of curriculum, then they come to question of pedagogies, then they come to question of or question of iconography, statues and the, and the, and the symbols. Uh, and then they come to a deeper question, which is even more difficult, the question of, uh, of institutional cultures, whereby when you are coming into a university, you are really coming for a civilizational uh, experience uh, to the extent that by the time you emerge out of the university, you are speaking another language. When you come out of the university, you are even further disconnected from your cultures, from your histories, from your languages. And if that continues to be the trajectory. Then the universities need really, to, we need to go back to the very idea of the university. And they indeed, uh, one of the issues which maybe we, we did not address here is that these universities are very problematic. They are, they are a gift from somewhere. And they also some are a gift of African nationalism. But African nationalism also had this modernist aspect inside. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not really a carryover from, say, pre-colonial universities like Sankore University in Timbuktu or Karayan University in Fez or al Hazar University in uh, in, uh, in Egypt, it is it is not a carryover. It's more of universities which the idea and the model came with colonialism, and that, that university it becomes a problem. But what I want to uh, to also say is that me myself, as I'm speaking now, I'm a product of that type of a university. Mm -hmm. and the issue is when we deal with this question of of, of decolonization, the fingers need not sometimes to point outside, it needs to point to us as the most problematic products of these westernized, modernized universities, which yeah. gave us all these languages, which were, gave us all these uh, problematic consciousness, uh, which, which, which makes us not 
not really see the world in the in the right sense. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, decolonizing the university is a, is a project, it's a collective project, yeah. um, but it starts with individual acts of self-critique yeah. and flexibility, right? Otherwise it goes nowhere, right? Because yeah. then we're just like always um, aiming the critique at something outside of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So we need, I think, scholars in particular need to enter these conversations with intellectual humility, right? And a commitment to completely understand um, how deeply colonization and colonial imaginary shape the institutions that we yeah. work in, right? So because it is a project that requires disruption, deconstruction, but also relearning and rebuilding our thought processes, practices, yeah. and relationships. Yeah. I think I always tell my students, you know, the real knowledge is outside of the university, right? So this, I mean, those are decolonial lives. It's the institutions yeah. that um, we need to decolonize, right? Yeah, and in the, in the, perhaps we also escalate to being honest about ourselves that as, as intellectuals there are some who are who, who actually bought into the issue of radical assimilation of what the seductive colonial project was selling to us mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that the question of our uh, excellency the question of standards and all that some are not looking at it in a in a very critical way they are just accepting it. This is what the University of London, it used to be a college of University of London. We need to maintain the standard of the University of London. But uh, nobody actually then questions who's ben who benefits from these standards, who benefits from this model of excellence. And I remember Nyerere in 1963 when he became the first black uh, chancellor of the University of East Africa, saying we need to really deal with this tension between uh, local interests and the and the, the global standards, we need we need to to work to work through that in a in a more creative way. We need not to throw away standards. Every civilization has its own standards, its mode of excellence. We need to to really deal with it in a in a more creative way. Uh, and then the second is then the 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 other mode of intellectuals. These ones who are, for lack of a bad a, a term, I will call it the liminal. In between, always navigating in between uh, what was imposed and what what you are critiquing. Then you have others who go to the level of anger and the radical alterity. Uh, in other words, the, instead of assimilationist, you then say Africans uh, Africans are different from other human beings. Then you go that other direction, which can also be very problematic. So I think this moment this conjecture in we are we need to take into account where we are coming from and we need to really maybe take fanon seriously on sociogenesis mm -hmm. that our problem really is sociogenetical the way we the processes the social processes how they produce us is what is what we need to face uh, and we face it honestly to the extent that uh, this question of saying should the decolonization take place in the university or should it take place in society my answer would be that the people who are trying to the university are the most problematic people. Uh, those ones who are in the communities, you will find they still speak their languages in most of the communities. You will find the, in terms of spiritualities, they still multiplicity of spirituality. Some are Christian, some they, they still practice the other spiritualities. And uh, you, you will find that it is there that you can then actually go and uh, learn rather than go there to save our lives. So that's, 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 that's my positionality so far. <clears throat> Prof Sabella and Prof Althea, I, I, my colleagues and I are sitting here in awe at, at some of your, uh, your answers and your contributions to, to this conversation, truly. And I think uh, it's reflected in the chat as well. People are, you know, are almost amazed and also quite self-reflective. Um, uh, and, and, and to do, uh, to, to kind of touch on these reactions, I'm gonna uh, pose a couple of questions to you uh, that we've received from, from participants joining us today. Um, some of which you've touched on, but I think, uh, yeah, people would just like to know more. Um, particularly to Prof Sabello, um, I know that you mentioned um, uh, the, the question of universities and, and, and Prof Althea as well, the, the tensions of decolonizing the university space. Um, so we have a question from Mubarak who asks, how can indigenous knowledge be applied in reconstructing the African identity, especially in the African education system? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe what we can do, Ayla, is to take about three or so questions. 
Sure. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, I, I am definitely aware of time. Um, but I think let's start with this one and, and then I'll move you on to the next two. Okay. Yeah, the question of uh, the kind of indigenous knowledge is, is a, it needs its own session. Yes, exactly. You <laughs> can pick apart that as well. It's a, it's a, it's a very loaded uh, uh, question. Uh, in its own, it's a. When we're talking about these issues of essentialization and others. They, they, they also speak to what is indigenous knowledge is and how do we define them? Are we defining them as you just recover a ready produced knowledge which was which was under a border of colonialism, or the indigenous knowledges are also themselves very, very, very dynamic to the extent that a philosopher like uh, uh, Pauline Untonji would prefer the word endogenous, not indigenous, uh, to say almost every civilization has its own knowledge, which 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 it departs from. Uh, but those knowledges are not ring, ring first from being affected by knowledges. Uh, but it is important for an African people who have been colonized, we have been denied, being human itself, we have been denied uh, uh, their histories, their cultures, their the, and, and, and their knowledges to really recover that type of knowledge. And it becomes very important at this conjecture where the knowledges which took us for over 500 years are actually exhausted. They are showing signs of exhaustion, particularly in the area of environment ecologies, and the old and the, some find really interesting ways of dealing with questions of ecology and the knowledge in indigenous uh, communities, in the way they have a harmonious relationship between the human and the non-human, and they, they don't actually hierarchize the sense of something being nature and something being natural resource. And they, I think I think that way the indigenous knowledge really comes in very handy to actually resolve such 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 so if we are redefining ourselves there is no way we can disconnect from some of the the alluvial uh, heritage uh, which can actually lift us from where we've been pushed to sit down yeah i think that's really uh, i would agree with that and i think one of the things that maybe i'll emphasize a little bit more is to realize that indigenous um knowledge, when we use that term, or indigenous knowledge, it's dynamic, it's changing, right? So we cannot um, pretend that it, it hasn't been affected by you know, other relationships, other knowledges, but also that with communities, things change, right? So they don't have to be, to be indigenous, there's no like knowledge, um, it's not pure or authentic in this way or, and static, right? And we have to allow that because I think many people want to search for something and this has been a um, you know, tension issue in diasporic and um, black studies for a long time, right? They want to search for this authentic kind of indigenous past and then center that. But that, what they're trying to center actually often is so divorced from what we would see as like, you know, historically indigenous cultures, right? Mm -hmm. So it becomes this kind of constructed um, identity or notion or culture that um, really doesn't work towards the project of resistance or decolonization, it feeds into it. Um, so I think that's really important. And it's important for, I think, variety. So Professor mentioned, you know, thinking about the environment, climate change, but also, you know, there's lots of questions about like, how do, you know, feminist, African feminist um, mm -hmm. analytical frameworks then help us understand kind of um, African and black identity and transnational blackness and things like that. So all of these questions that can be rooted within kind of those indigenous frameworks as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to, uh, my, my next question is a little bit loaded, given that there are quite a few overlaps between three participants, Raisa, Elisa, Jamal uh, Fernandez, and Maxine Thomas-Asante. Um, and I think the question to, to both our speakers is con concerns the how of decolonization. So number one, uh, for Maxine asks, how do we uh, st begin to embody decolonized identities on a kind of personal and on the ground uh, basis, and then 
Jamal's question is also how do we begin, as you as you both have mentioned, uh, noting historical starting point to uh, questions surrounding African identity as well as the decolonization uh, process. How do we begin to think about our pre-colonial or decolonized identity? Um, and then Raisa says, what is uh, you know? And I will add, in uh, given Prof. Sabello mentioned, uh, protests like Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall. Uh, you know, the most recent Black Lives Matter. Um, what is the role or how can uh, Africans on the continent and across the diaspora uh, play a role in, in, in creating those solidarities uh, in, in the process of decolonization and, and as Maxine uh, kind of verbalized, embodying those, the decolonial process at that level? Mm -hmm. I should I go first. <laughs> Go ahead, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, the question of embodying uh, the, the decolonial uh, uh, moment and the, decolon the decolonial struggles, I think it's a, we have no option but to embody it. It is a, you know, some people will call it a, an option, but I think for African people, it is a necessity. And when we say it is a necessity, as long as we can feel that there is colonial matrices of power which actually survived the de political decolonization of the 20th century, and that these colonial matrices of power are not just an intellectual curiosity, but they are also matrices of power which underdevelop, which actually sustain the divisions between the zones of opulence and the zones of, of poverty. And they, if they are like that, therefore is really a life and a death struggle, as far as I'm concerned. It's a, it's a life and death struggle in which as long as you are, one is conscious that there are structural, systemic, and they even relational uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, issues which actually make some people not enjoy full life or good life or good living. Therefore, we have no option but to embody it because it is about re-existence after centuries of existing as subjects. So I will, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will find that to be very important. Then for us who are embedded in the, in the institutions of higher education, whether on the continent or outside, I think the, the most important thing is what we have been trying to emphasize here, that it starts with me. Mm -hmm. It starts with me. I must not create an impression that I'm the most decolonized person in this panel. <laughs> this, 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 this won't be true. I need to be honest to myself that I'm a product of this same process. And immediately I'm aware of that. It means every day I'm actually be thinking of how to pull myself out of the colonial matrices of power. And then in terms of uh, the pre-colonial, the colonial, and the present, I think the best way to think about it is to go back to three thinkers whom I think they, they actually assist us to think through this. Uh, one is Edward Wilmot Blyden. The second is Kwame Nkrumah himself. And the third is Al Mazur. And uh, I'm, I'm bringing them three because they explore the same question. You remember, Edward Blyden talking about in that book on Christianity, Islam, and the Negro. He is actually speaking about saying, how do we think about the experience which we have undergone, the, our pre-colonial heritage, the Islamic uh, intervention, the Christian Eurocentric intervention? How do we think about it creatively in such a way that, that, that it becomes a heritage from which we learn, we learn particular particular lesson. And then, then Nkrumah comes in and coins consciousness, consciousness as a synthesis of what is good in the Islamic, what is good in the indigenous African, and what is good in the, in the, in the, in the Christian uh, 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 heritage. And then he says the African of today will be a synthesis of all this. And then uh, <clears throat> Al-Mazuri then coins the triple heritage, the triple heritage as part of, of trying to, to think through these, these issues. And I think this will then resolve the problem of 
of then the mistaken problem of always thinking about decolonization as going back. Mm -hmm. it, it is not about going back. There is, there is no back anyway uh, to, to go to. So the issue is really how to, to think through these processes, painful as they are, struggles, painful as they are. What type of African do we want to produce? What type of identity do we want to produce out of this? And it is within that context that we can also think about the solidarities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think just to add to that, I think um, Professor Swabi covered a lot of what I, mm. I would say or think of as well, but it, we are the embodied experience, right? So really it's about understanding your own experience, being able to then claim that space and seek out knowledge. Right? So I often get questions about, uh, you know, someone mentioned kind of pre-colonial identity, how do we reclaim that? But often, you know, that's not the starting point. The starting point is self-reflexivity, self-critique mm -hmm. and understanding or trying to understand what your experience is now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And many people don't, um, you know, they don't think about that. What is your experience now? What is, you know, in your own context, wherever you are, how do you understand blackness? What is the experience of those around you? And how do you connect those experiences? Mm -hmm. right? Because searching for something in the past to help you frame your identity now is not going to help you understand your identity really, right? It's going to confuse you, right? Because you're never going to be able to like, it's, it's something you're searching for that, that doesn't exist almost to help you fill a gap. You need to begin with your own kind of experience, your own um, self-reflexivity, understanding kind of your own existential existence, right? And then from there move on to understanding the relationships with others. And as Chris, you know, um, said, you know, that's where we begin to think about solidarity, right? And that's that awakening process, that understanding of your own kind of existential blackness, that is um, that is fundamental for any kind of resistance as well, right? Because this is through this, your own experience, the experience of those around you that you begin to understand struggle, you begin to understand what needs to be resisted. And they, in, if I can add the last part of it, parallelly with the solidarity question, because the solidarity issue is a political issue. And the solidarity issue, uh, it cannot happen unless we do what uh, perhaps Ernesto Lankiao terms, creating an influential chain. In other words, there are various struggles are always not a single issue. Uh, uh, they, they are multiple. But uh, how do we create that chain which actually then say, uh, women are fighting against Paki, some people are fighting against race, some are fighting against class exploitation. And how do we bring all these people together into, into a coalition without necessarily hierarchizing the struggles? And they make sure that there is a package of saying the grievances are like this, and they, then we see the relations in between in, 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 among them. For instance, at the moment, every time we push the decolonization, I always try to emphasize that, but there is no decolonization with depatriarchization. In other words, it therefore means the feminist movements are actually part of decolonizing. And they decolonize a particular power structure. They target a particular power structure. So that way, you will then create a, a solidarity. A, what sometimes a, is used in a confusing way is perhaps the concept of intersectionality. Sometimes it's then used to divide rather than to say, to complexify the issues. They know, but don't talk about a single a single issue of a struggle. The struggle, they, they are multiple dimensions, and how do we make sure that everyone everyone's uh, grievance is taken into account? But in order to be taken into account, we take into account in order to do that to do what in order to formulate a political movement, because a political movement needs to be equivalential change of all these or of all these uh, uh, historical grievances and uh, even the present grievances. So that way, I think that's where, you know, the popular comes in. Yeah. And I think just to add to that, you know, social justice spaces are always spaces that need to be um, where people can bring different conflicts or contestations, where they bring their experiences, right? If that can happen in a social justice space, yeah. then really that's, you know, that's really problematic, then it's not a social justice space, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this concept of intersectionality is often used and taught 
in a really problematic way in our institutions. And therefore it becomes this additive notion where you know, you're black, you're a woman, you're queer. And mm -hmm. there's no like a deeper analysis of, of what intersectionality was really supposed to allow us to do. And that was to be able to understand how different experiences and identities are attached to structural um, violences and what that means in terms of how we understand the way that these people exist and uh, the struggles that they have and how we then resist that collectively through different, on different vectors. On that note, uh, I, I I'm blown away. I, I don't have I don't have words for for the appreciation um, I have for the complexity of your answers um, and and the answers that it it gives all of us to think about. Um, I think those of us who are who are watching. Um, before uh, wrapping up, I, I I'd like to ask uh, both of you if you could limit your closing remarks to about one minute. Hopefully, they can uh, kind of be on time for the rest of the schedule. So one minute closing remarks and then I uh, will, will bid you thank you. I don't know. I mean, in terms of, do you have, do you want to go first, Professor? Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in a minute, I say the, at the center of the whole issue of decolonizing uh, uh, African identities is the question of rehumanizing after mm -hmm. centuries of dehumanize, dehumanization. That would be my, my closing. Yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't really have anything prepared for closing, but I think, you know, and I, I can't see the audience today, but I think the decolonizing discourse, even though it's, it's something that will take some time um, and is very problematic in the way it's being conceptualized at the moment, is really exciting. Um, and I encourage um, the audience to kind of think about uh, the responses to the last question about where that starts, right? That the need to start with ourselves and really kind of embody and understand our relationships and experiences. Because that, I think, is a really powerful movement. And with that, I say thank you very much to Prof. Sabello and to Dr. Althea for joining us today and to all our participants from, for joining us from wherever they may be uh, on this virtual stage. I, I, I can confidently say the, the LSE Africa Summit program for this year was, was much richer for both of your contributions. Um, I think we are leaving this session uh, with, with much to think about in terms of really um, like Prof. Sabello said, going from the intellectual into the existential to, to define what Africa and African identity means to each of us. Um, and on that note, I, I encourage participants to join the, the next couple of sessions coming up. Uh, our next panel is going to be uh, on Africa's road to recovery from COVID-19. Uh, simultaneously, we'll be running our career fair uh, that you can access from the arena. Um, and with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.